Hi, welcome to Revved Up for Sunday, a lectionary podcast from the clergy of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm Justin Crisp. Peter Walsh. Elizabeth Garnsey. And today we have the beginning of Luke's Sermon on the Plain, not to be confused with the Sermon on the Mount, although, question mark, maybe. Uh, Jesus is telling us who's blessed and who's not. And spoiler alert, is not who we think. <laughs> Let's hear the scriptures. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, the sixth chapter, beginning at the 17th verse. Jesus came down with the twelve apostles and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Here ends the reading. So what do you all make of this? Revy. <laughs> Well, I feel like Luke, uh, you know, he doesn't soften anything here, like True. Matthew tries to do. And, uh, but it's, it's, um, it's right in keeping with the spirit of Luke where, it, you know, he's gathered in, uh, in Jerusalem, you know, he's gathered in his place. He's being followed by big crowds. And um, I like this idea that he's standing on a level place. I love that, mm. that word. And, mm. you know, he's there firmly grounded in the earth, you know, and he's in Matthew, it's on a mountain. There's a certain spirituality that's heightened in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. But when we get to Luke, Jesus is always earthier and, you know, taking the dusty roads and he's talking to crowds. And the word all in here is in here a bunch of times, you know, a great multitude of people from all Judea, all Jerusalem, the coast of Tyre and Sidon, um, all who in the, were in the crowd tried to touch him, you know, power came out and healed all of them. I mean, what does that look like? Yeah. That's crazy. And then, uh, so, you know, we get this idea of his universal appeal and his um, very spiritual, spirit-driven power that's, that's healing everywhere he goes, and the people are so drawn to him. Um, and then he kind of sobers up his disciples, like, don't mm. get drunk on this euphoria, you know, or something right. like that. Yeah. And I think he's sort of taking them down a notch to put them on a level place where they're not, you know, just riding the wave of all this excitement. Um, and to take a good look at their lives, you know, they, they, you know, to be poor and hungry, it's, it's not like you're blessed if you're, you know, cash poor. I think it's this idea in Luke that if you know you don't have everything you need, you have to look to God. <clears throat> to help you and to hmm. be with you and to fill you, you know, and to, to come into the, to be in the, for, to have the kingdom of God is to have, um, you know, this in, in Luke, it's to let God dwell in you. You know, it's, it's got to make a place for that. And I think so in Luke, it to be poor, it's really to make a space for God and know that you don't have everything you need. Hmm. And um, same with hunger and, you know, this idea of weeping, I feel is any of anyone who's experienced great sorrow or loss, um, you know, nothing's wasted. And I, I think here Jesus is saying, 
um, you know, don't walk away from your griefs or, or avoid grief, but know that it's going to deepen your, your sense of compassion and give you something to give to someone else and, you know, connect to help you connect. And I don't know what the word laugh is. I'll be interested to know if either of you looked up the Greek for that, but mm. it's an interesting choice of translation. So, um, but anyway, those are my first thoughts. I, I feel like it's a, a very spiritual wisdom teaching here. Mm. I really, I really like Luke's, you know, his method. Yeah. Jesus's method, but the way Luke gets it down, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, th it really interesting uh, to hear you reflect on that. So I, um, so he's coming down, he's coming down from prayer, right? So in, yeah. in Luke's gospel, he goes, Jesus goes up to pray and then he comes down to speak where we have the Sermon on the Mount uh, mimicking Moses uh, on the Mount in, in Matthew. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now, we're, now, we're speaking to, now we're speaking to Gentiles and we're not mostly to a Gentile audience and not to uh, uh, a, a Jewish audience where Moses' paradigm would be the way. Mm. Uh, I also uh, find that there's, there's so much going on in the opening portions of this, some of you know, which you touched on, where there's disciples and then there's the multitude. We have Judea, Jerusalem, and the entire inside, and so we have... We have, um, we have Jew and Gentile gathering around him. We have the multitude pushing on him. We have the, to hear him, the teaching, to touch him, mm -hmm. which is his healing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so what's he, the two things Jesus does most, which is teach about the kingdom of God and heal, mm -hmm. uh, is certainly in Luke's gospel. And the power is coming out of him. And then he got this big crowd of him, and then he zeroes in on his disciples. So this is mm -hmm. a, he's, he's not actually right. talking to the multitude. There are other times when he talks to the multitude and has a broad teaching. Mm -hmm. Now he's talking to Jesus' followers. So he's got the 12 apostles up top, right, mm -hmm. with him, and that is the disciples. So the, and the disciples are the people beyond the 12 apostles. Oh, so right. now he's speaking to a broader following, but he's speaking to Jesus' people. Mm -hmm. If you want to be my people. Now, and, and so he's addressing, uh, blessed are, and then we get... Um, Blessed are you, so this is not blessed are the poor, mm -hmm. poor across all the world of all time. He's talking about blessed are you of my disciples who are poor. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a much more, in my uh, understanding, a much more targeted teaching. So he's saying for those of you who mm -hmm. follow me and if you're poor, the kingdom is yours. For those of you who are following me and you're hungering, you you are you know you will be filled. You may still be hungry, but you are going to be filled. So this is mm -hmm. this the the scope of this might be a bit narrower, and to say that within the Son of Man you're reviled for the Son of Man, uh, rejoice. Which uh, I wonder if rejoicing involves laughter, which I think there's a little inconsistency here. <laughs> uh, and and so he's again talking to disciples, and you did an initial interpretation of which I liked, of the blessings at the top, but mm -hmm. it's the woes that make this most interesting. Mm -hmm. That's, it's the woes <laughs> that are like, boom, uh, and now for us to contend with. Because right. if we take this flat-footed, there's a way to take this rich, I'm rich. Okay, by the world standards, I'm are, rich. Yeah. Okay, yeah, by I'm full. I had a I had a nice practice. The truth is, I'm a little bit hungry, but I could have had more food. <laughs> uh, but full, and I'm laughing because I like these people, right? Right. And for yeah, the most, not everybody, but for the most part, people speak well of me. So yeah. I'm 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 a goner. Uh, if you take the bottom half of the page, right? I'm all of those things. Yeah. As are you. Absolutely. We won't say anything about Elizabeth. But yeah, we're leaving Elizabeth out. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I you're. You're right. I mean, one of the um, one of the exegetical questions, one of the interpretative questions that we have with the with the beatitudes in either Luke or Matthew, and I want to visit the the Matthean passage here in just a moment, uh, is are these entrance requirements to the kingdom of God, or are they God's eye view descriptions of the world as it really truly is? Uh, that's good. Uh, mm -hmm. So, like, you know, are these virtues? that Jesus is talking about, like, it would be better if you guys were poor, it'd be better if you guys were hungry, it'd be better right. if you guys would weep, it'd be better if people hated you, etc. And when you are those things, then congratulations, you get your ticket into heaven. Are they entrance requirements? Right. Or are they functions of the, are they a, another variation on the theme of the great reversal, which we've right. talked about mm -hmm. multiple times, uh, both in relation to Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark, and also here in the Gospel of Luke. It's mm -hmm. certainly a theme in the Gospel of Luke, which is yep. uh, much more, um, uh, it, it is more 
earthy. I think it's more worldly. It's more focused on kind of practical, pragmatic, social configurations, etc. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in the contrast with Matthew, which I, I want to, again, I want to uh, just compare them uh, in just a moment. But I, I tend to think that these are not entrance requirements. I tend to think that they are parts of the great reversal. Um, yep. And it's not necessarily that every one of these needs to be reversed. In Luke, I think that, you know, the, the poor inheriting the kingdom, the hungry being filled, the weeping, laughing, those who are hated and reviled and defamed, um, you know, uh, being um, their reputations or their, um, uh, their, their well-being and self-esteem and esteem of the community being restored. These are all good things. But there are certain things in the Matthew version, like um, those who are merciful, those who um, are peacemakers, etc. Those things don't need to be reversed exactly. So it's not that you need like a one-to-one -one correspondence like mm -hmm. where you got rich on one side and you got poor on the other and you're going to swap places. It's just rather that... Um, these are the people who, from God's perspective, are the blessed in Christ. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven, even though it doesn't look like it on earth, <laughs> even though it doesn't look like, in this, like it in this world. And I don't necessarily mean just like in the life of the world to come, the kingdom is going to be theirs, although perhaps there's some of that. I mean, Jesus does say, you know, your reward is going to be great in heaven here for Luke. Um, but I think it's it, there's something about um, there's something fortunate <laughs> about being on the underside of the world from God's perspective, and I do wonder if it has something to do with the fact that these are all people whose only hope is God. Mm -hmm. That's, that's something yeah, that that's um, good. Uh, uh, Karl Barth um, suggested that uh, that the poor, the hungry, those who are weeping, those who are reviled. Etc. These are all people whose only hope in this world is God, and there's something fortunate about that. There's something. Um, so blessing is not exactly a reward. It's more like. Um, so I don't know if this is an apocryphal story of Karl Barth. I've not been able to find it like in any of his books. But people say that Karl Barth said that blessed here could be translated "you lucky bum." Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like you lucky. <laughs> Those of you who were poor, you lucky bum. Yours is the kingdom of God. So it's not quite like, congratulations, you were really virtuous, you were great, you mm -hmm. get to go to heaven. It's more that um, uh, there's your relation to Christ is somehow great. And you lucky bum, it's so great. And it's the opposite of the people who the world would think are fortunate. So God's fortune and the world's fortune are opposed to one another. I think that's one of that's one way of reading this. Um, but I'm curious about what you guys make of the difference between Luke and Matthew. Now, lots of people like to hate on Matthew's version because uh, they spiritualize it. And I actually, I don't know that I'm there, but I'd be interested in the conversation. So, so here we've got the poor, the hungry, the weep, and those who are hated, reviled, excluded, defamed on account of the Son of Man. Those are the ones who are blessed. Um, in Matthew, it's the poor in spirit, not the poor, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, not the straight up hungry, uh, the merciful, mm -hmm. the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, and people who are reviled and persecuted and about whom all kinds of evil are uttered falsely on Jesus's account. And that's all. Um, uh, anyway, what do you guys make of the contrast? I think in, in Luke, Jesus is, is teaching, stopping to teach his disciples quite a bit. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, you know, in Matthew, we get the entire, you know, Matthew 5 to 8 Sermon on the Mount, which goes on and on. And so that this, the Beatitudes is just a small portion. And then mm -hmm. he goes on to say in Matthew similar things about do not worry about your life and what you wear and what you eat and drink. <clears throat> and I think that Luke gets that all in kind of in these woes mm. that don't be concerned about uh, your wealth or you, that you are full and have all your stuff, um, you know, pleasure seeking or whatever laughing now might mean. Um, th these and people speaking well of you. I think these are all things that speak to our need for validation from other people and mm. our need to be approved of socially or in in good standing or 
have a prominent position, mm -hmm. you know, things like this that I think Matthew gets at in a different way in his Sermon on the Mount. Mm. So in a way, Luke's kind of more concise, but it's it's harder to tease out, perhaps. Mm. But um, but I think that Jesus is always trying to like change the way people see. So it's really um, seeing the world in a different way, the great reversal, and also t drawing his disciples' attention much, much more to the broad, the higher horizon and to the, the long road with Jesus, not the fame, not the, the tangible evidence that he's powerful or the signs or the wonders, but, you know, to yeah. their, their actual transformation yeah. and their ability to see their need of God and the power that that's going to have for the whole world. Mm. Yeah, wow. Uh, I don't see that... that um, Matthew's uh, take on Jesus's Sermon on the Mount and Luke's take on the Sermon on the Plain uh, have to be either brought together or kept apart. I, I, mm -hmm. Jesus lived, I mean, Jesus taught for three years. He said a lot of stuff. And I have no problem with Jesus saying every word in the Sermon mm -hmm. on the Mount. And I have no problem with him saying every word in the Sermon on the Plain. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, and I think they're all, I think they're all good and they're all true. I think that the question here is how do we understand them within the scriptures that they've been brought to us in the gospels they've been brought mm -hmm. to us. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, blessed uh, are the poor in spirit is one of the great spiritual teachings of all time in any tradition like uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the movement to love your neighbors yourself, the golden rule, blessed are the poor in spirit is a humility before God is the disposition of holiness. And so I, 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 I would never denigrate any of them or I would never see any need to put them together. Uh, and in Jesus, you know, the way it is in Luke, so he gets, he's, he's, got his, he's got three, right? And then he's got 12, and we go by numbers here, mm -hmm. and he gets some disciples, and we're going to get to the 70 here also, uh, which <laughs> is the next number coming our way, but, and he, in the Sermon on the Plain, this is, this is a, a teaching moment. He's going to teach them, as you say, mm -hmm. on the road. He's getting them ready, and so we get the initial bam. Here, here we go, and he, as he addresses uh, his people, I think that um, in the Sermon on the Plain, I mean, it's like getting wackoed right in the right, right, boom here. I mean, we're in the, yeah. it doesn't stop here. I mean, we're going to get love your enemies next week, right? The Sermon on the Plain. At every at every turn, Jesus is Jesus's teachings are a, are, are a gut punch to comfort, uh, and mm -hmm. and uh, he is always pushing us farther than we want to be. He's always pushing us out of our comfort zones uh, in all of his teachings. And, uh, and, and I think that the, the, I love your phrase used earlier, God's eye view. I mean, I've mm -hmm. been at this a long time. I'm not so sure I ever heard that phrase in the same way, or I've ever even heard the phrase at all, but I'm, I'm going to steal it and I'll give you a credit <laughs> for it, but God's <laughs> eye view. I, I also think that one of the questions is here. So I, I, when we talk about in the kingdom, the coming kingdom, um, I have this idea about what happens after you die mm. and that after you die, you see uh, a fuller fullness than we are able to see now. See in the mirror dim. We see in the mirror uh, dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Sort of in in Pauline's understanding of this, mm -hmm. and uh, that which we see face to face is 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 the, the beatitude of of whether or not it's Jesus face to face or the the something of the, the 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 being of God, which we wouldn't say we would see face to face exactly. Theologically, you can help me on that. Um, but we also see ourselves face to face. We might see mm. everything face to face. Mm. And if there's any woe, mm. Mm. it's like, dang, I was so rich and I didn't help all these other people. So we're going to get to further in the gospel here. We're going to get um, uh, Abraham right. uh, and the, the, yeah. the, the poor guy, Lazarus. Lazarus yeah. Thank you for right. getting the names mm. right here. And he's going to say, you know, he didn't help the he didn't help the poor, yeah. and and he's going to feel terrible, and he's going to have to live with this wild woeness. And man, I was so full, and just down the street there were people that were hungry, mm -hmm. and I didn't help them, and I feel miserable for eternity because when I had the shot, shot I didn't. Mm -hmm. I was laughing, and I missed caring for those who were hurting. Mm -hmm. That and that's the pain of that is is too much. And and all these people thought I was great, and you know what? I wasn't. <laughs> and I got I got absorbed in my own absorption, and I didn't realize mm -hmm. that wow. you know it's really about the truth of the Son of Man 
and his teachings and trying to follow his way of love, mm-hmm. which we're all going to follow in our human and fallible ways, but giving it a good shot is is the best you got going for you. So that's where I think mm. the woe is. I think the wow. woe is yeah. is that we're too self-satisfied and we miss the holiness that is there because we're we, we're too protected. We're not burnished enough. And, and I'm mm. coming to you, Sex, I really want to hear what you say. Yeah. One of the gifts of the pandemic, you said this, is truth-telling. You said that in one of our staff meetings. Mm-hmm. I think the pandemic has taken off a sheer, a layer or two of varnish on our humanity, yeah. and we're all pooped. We're pandemic pooped, and now we can see with truth that people are hurting all over the place. Right. And that's the eyes that, that Jesus is wow. wanting. That, mm. That's what this is about. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, and I, I, it's powerful. I love the fact that in your vision of the life of the world to come, that one of the transformations that happens to us is that we get the God's eye view, and the God's eye view becomes our view, as it were, um, with all of its consequences here. Um, yeah, I, it's just to, um, oh, so much to say, but just one little, um, one little like, for the Bible scholars at home, or for anybody who's preparing to teach. <laughs> oh, the Bible I, scholars. I have a little intervention I want to, I know, I know. Blessed are the Bible scholars, for they are worn out. Uh, and probably <laughs> underappreciated, I don't know, just like the theologians. Um, <laughs> I have a little intervention I want to stage. So there are some people, some scholars, who say that when you put Luke and Matthew side by side, they don't come to the conclusion that they can all be true, as you as you were saying. And they don't come to the conclusion that they're all compatible. Okay. Instead, what they think is that um, Luke has fewer. <laughs> and uh, Luke has fewer here. We've got basically four blessings, and then you got a bunch of, then you got four woes, and then Matthew, you kind of expand it, and so they speculate that because Luke and Matthew maybe share a sayings source, which is sometimes known as Q, which is thought to be it's a hypothetical collection of Jesus's sayings mm-hmm. and teachings, etc., uh, which would be a common source for both Luke and Matthew, and it would explain why Luke and Matthew have stories which um, Mark doesn't have, but why they both have these stories. Um, Anyway, they think that maybe, because there are fewer in Luke, maybe there were fewer in Q, and so these sayings from Luke are more authentic than the Matthew sayings. And I just want to say that that makes an assumption that assumes to know too much. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't actually know which of these versions historically we have any grounds to say, no, 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 this one's closer to what he actually said or this one's closer to what he actually said. Because, yeah, maybe it went that Q had four blessings and four woes, and then Matthew takes them, and Matthew's like, Matthew's a, I I don't know, Matthew's a scribe to a tax collector, so he's got more money, so he wants to spiritualize them. Then he adds a whole bunch more to them. Mm -hmm. Maybe, or maybe there were as many as Matthew has, and Luke cut them down and consolidated them. (laughs) Because Luke wanted to be concise. Right? So it's just to say, I think it's an open question. And so if you get into an historical debate about, like, well, what did the man really say? Uh-huh. I don't actually know we have enough evidence no. No. to know for sure right. which of these is closer. And so I would avoid the whole debate right. and say, why can't they all be? I mean, he did. Jesus ostensibly said a lot of things in his three years. Uh, and they don't have to be competitive. And right. I like the fact that our conversation has gone come to a place where Matthew and Luke are not actually competitive. Right. Um, the thing that I found in my study of, of this in the last week, um, the most powerful, was a, um, an observation made by George Hunsinger, who's a, a theologian at Princeton, and he, he writes, he's a scholar of Karl Barth, among other things, and, and Hunsinger <laughs> says um, that the Beatitudes work partly because they are true first of Jesus, and mm-hmm. then they are true of everyone else by extension. Mm-hmm. So Jesus first is the one who's poor, the one who's hungry, the one who weeps, the one who's hated, excluded, reviled. He's the poor in spirit, the mourning, the meek, the one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who, the one who's persecuted for righteousness sake and the one who's reviled and persecuted and about whom people utter all kinds of evil. And that what makes, hmm. what, what makes these folks lucky bums is that they are like Christ. Mm-hmm. And if we want to find him, we know exactly where to get him. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. That's so good. Right. And I, I, don't, <clears throat> I, like, I appreciate the comparison and the wondering about what's closer to what Jesus really said or not. And I, I, I think that's why, you know, the genius of keeping all these four Gospels side by side in our mm. scriptures is, 
useful because Jesus cannot be contained in any one gospel and not exhaustively known through all four together or anything. We're just, we have these as a window to look through, but until we live it and walk the road, we can't come to full understanding or until we get to the place of great enlightenment and um, the final mercy of seeing us ourselves as we really are. Um, You know, so I think that in a way it doesn't matter. It's more, and if Jesus cared deeply about us remembering his every word, he would have written it down himself. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, yeah. But, uh, or told them what to do or whatever. He didn't, he was not a control freak. Yeah. And, you know, Matthew is more fastidious. He's trying to sort of speak to the lost temple people and give them a new understanding of the mosaic law. And, you know, he's mm. more dot every I and cross every T. And Luke, Luke lives on the street. You know, he's like, this is street talk, Jesus, and being with the people, it's messy. You know, it's like the way I speak French versus someone at the Sorbonne, you know. I, I went to work on the streets of Paris, but I never really studied in a great institution. Um, so it's not that I'm the equivalent uh, by any means, of, like <laughs> Luke's Jesus, but I just feel like there's a, a spirit in these Gospels that just is de- driven towards a certain readership at the time that they were written, mm. and they're appropriate to that. Place, and now we get to benefit from all of them together. Mm, that's really good. I'll say you parlez vous a whole lot more Francais than I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Peter, any, any last word from you? No, I don't think, I, I, just to say, to reiterate, I, Jesus is not to be contained mm. in any way by, uh, by us, by the Gospels, by anything. He is at every turn beyond us, challenging us, loving us more deeply than we are love, loving ourselves and also challenging us, pushing us out of our comfort zones more than we want to. Mm-hmm. So he's, I like, he's not contained at all. So if this is, makes you uncomfortable, get in line. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to make you uncomfortable, right? I mean, you have to become really comfortable with discomfort it's because true. if you think it's you're true. just going to mold Jesus to so you're feeling great, you really missed it. Mm-hmm. It's true. Get in line. And we would love it if you got other people in line to, uh, to listen, like, and <laughs> subscribe to this, uh, to this podcast and help us share God's grace with the world in great need. Uh, you're in our prayers. God bless you. Be in touch with us. We love you. Take good care. Bye-bye. Oh, 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 oh